So I hope you guys aren't as cold as it is in the front up here. <laughs> okay, so um, look, I just wanted to say it's really it's a great opportunity to come over here again. This is the third time I've been at Coach and I always have a great time and they find something for me to do on the program, which I appreciate. But uh, on the big data side of things, I think that's really important, that idea which you're fostering here about bridging international collaborations because overall it's a very immature industry actually and I think there's a lot we can learn from each other. So I hope I can contribute to that today. So as, uh, as Australia's version of uh, Coach, we've, run we've um, actually been running data-related conferences for the last four years. Started with an emphasis on data governance, uh, and that was going really well. And um, I'd been in the States, and everyone was talking about big data. And at the time, no one was talking about big data in Australia. In healthcare, they weren't even talking about it in business. By the time the conference came around, they certainly were. So we've, um, we've actually um, started doing these big data and healthcare analytics events to try and actually stimulate conversation, drive it and lead it in Australia and those events are proving really successful. So some of the data that I'm and uh, examples I'm going to be talking through here today are actually from, um, from those events. So data, where is it coming from? Hopefully you're not like my dentist um, who has a very similar system to this and I was horrified when I saw that, but he did treat my mother. Um, he took her teeth out when she was 17. So my dentist is, uh, you know, he's a great dentist, so I let him get away with these card-based systems. But where is the data coming from? You guys all deal with data every day. These are some examples of the data sets that you would easily have available. By far in healthcare, the strongest data sets that we have are still the billing and financial systems. They seem to be quite universal everywhere, seeing some heading nods in the audience. But there is so much more data um, that we either have available to us or we will very soon. If you start looking at genomic data, that, I mean, we've had a huge focus on our big data events just purely around genomics uh, because once that data starts getting integrated into data sets that, you know, consumers and clinicians want and need and deserve access to, then it opens up a whole new world of uh, challenges. So what do we know for sure? Well, we know that data is really important and it's going to become even more critical if we want to deliver high quality, safe care and we want to do it sustainably. This is a problem that plagues, you know, all of our countries all around the world, that idea of sustainable care and it's a challenge. What else do we know? We're not very prepared, unfortunately. So this study came out last week. It's an American study. Um, so there you go, Australian talking about an American study. But um, I had a look at the results of this. So what they did is they surveyed uh, healthcare CIOs and I think 98 people from memory actually responded to this survey. And they found that um, nearly all of the respondents believe that data analytics will play a big role. Uh, in delivering healthcare in the future. But only three quarters of them, um, th well, uh, three quarters only, reported only moderate or minimal commitment to integrating analytics into practice. For the majority of people, there was hardly any actual commitment by their organisations, and uh, that's concerning. In Australia, that survey hasn't been done, but I can tell you anecdotally that it wouldn't be a hell of a lot different in it at home. So, Australian government approach. So I'm going to start really big picture here. So, this is a picture. The gentleman there is, um, at the time anyway, he was a minister. Uh, his name is Kim Carr and he was Minister for Human Services. He's standing next to Fiona Stanley, who in 2003 was, the Austral was Australian of the Year. She's an amazing woman, um, a health researcher. So this picture was taken at our event, which was in April 2013, uh, so just over a year ago now, and we'd invited the Minister for Human Services to deliver the opening keynote. And um, anyway, when we invite keynote speakers to present at our conferences, we ask them to give us a sentence. If there's one sentence that we can give to delegates that will describe the theme of your talk or a major thing you want them to take away with you, can you let us know what it is? And so Kim sent us this one. Government data is the new oil. We must tap and refine it for all Australians. And my staff sent it to me and I'm like, did he really say that? 
he could get in a bit of trouble, I think. <laughs> I don't know whether he really should, but okay then. Uh, anyway, um, about a week before the conference, uh, uh, Senator Kim Carr resigned from his ministerial position. And how I found that out was because I was in a meeting. Um, I think I might have even been at PwC that day. Anyway, my phone was going crazy. It was just vibrating nonstop. And I was like, my staff know I'm in a meeting. What are they doing texting me? Anyway, and I pick up the phone and they're all panicking because, yeah, a week before the conference and the senator had resigned and it was all over the television. And uh, anyway, and I wrote back to them like, that's brilliant news because he wasn't going to show up in person because he had ministerial commitments internationally. I'm like, well, now he's going to have free time, isn't he? So he should be able to come. And as you see, he actually did. Now, he didn't resign uh, because of anything to do with the quote he'd given us, um, but it actually gave him a hell of a lot of freedom, I think, uh, is what ended up happening in his speech. And uh, a few slides I've got here, I actually have put it almost word for word, uh, and I'll read through it, which I know is bad um, manners, but I think if you can get the context of what he's saying, you can uh, get its value. He started off by giving this quote, which I was like, again, God, this guy's just trying to get in all sorts of trouble. So he's sitting there still, rep he's not the minister, but he's still representing the government. Uh, he's a senator. And he says, you know, governments don't measure our success by results, but by activity. And, uh, you know, which is a famous quote from Sir Humphreys from, um, from Yes Minister. Anyway, and I, again, we're like, oh, this is going to be good. And he started with this quote, and he made the point that governments often, well, not just governments, but governments a lot, don't actually measure the data, because if you measure the data, then, um, yep, you have to do something about it, you know? If you're not doing it well, you have to do something about it. So that's how his talk started. And then he said, in 2011, the Australian government merged multiple government departments, effectively, under the Department of Human Services. And I also know from, uh, Anik, uh, from someone who knows him quite well, he, um, was not, he was not in favour with the Prime Minister of the day. So he was given this portfolio as a bit of a punishment. Oh, you're going to stick you in human services. Anyway, and uh, he went and had a look at his new portfolio and um, was stunned by the data that, they had, that he had access to as Minister and what that department could do with that. And he, so he gave this story in his speech and he said that the department took possession of all the data those agencies had collected and there was close to 3 million gigabytes of data just in the Centrelink program alone. And he talks about the data opening up the potential for hereto impossible research. It is a byproduct of the services that we provide to 7 million Australians accessing payments from Centrelink and the 22 million Australians who get covered by Medicare and a over a million children going up with the assistance of child support. It is an unsurpassed longitudinal rec record of Australian society. And then he said that the mission for the Department of Human Services is to release the potential benefit for the Australian people in this public asset. So he was referring to our data as being of pu a public asset. Our default position is that there should be open access to public data for legitimate researchers as long as privacy is respected and costs are fairly shared. And then he showed his vision, which was to have a bipartisan ag arrangement. And he'd been working behind the scenes on this bipartisan arrangement so that it, wouldn't, it would outlast him, it would outlast the government, so that we could actually look at you know, putting together these massive government data sets and using them for the public good. And it, really importantly, he was planning on collaborating with researchers as well. And he says that it is research based on real evidence that equips us to change the world that the potential of a truly integrated data set allows us to improve the management of chronic disease, including cancers. It's critical to the underpinning of hospitals and the planning that we have to do, underpins the evaluation of spending on things like pharmaceuticals, which is a huge cost, but a very, you know, everyone would want that to continue, um, and help us importantly, and this was brand new, no one was talking about social determinants of healthcare very much in Australia a year ago. Now they are. And he was talking about it's in, data will be important to help us establish links from poverty to poor health. So after he finished his speech, then Fiona Stanley, ex-Australian of the year and all-round just amazing person, gave her talk. And she said to us, why are we not using existing data which measures health and other outcomes across all population and which, when linked together, would enable huge and cost-effective improvements to health and social services? 
And um, you guys will get copies of all these slides. So I've put in a bit more data than because I figured it could be good resources for you. So I won't go through it all. But her talk was talking, she talked very much without this stuff we've all heard before about how do we get data into wisdom. But in her position of power, and as you can see from that photo of the two of them, with her and Kim Carr in those huge positions of power, they were actually able to influence things. And a lot of Fiona's work, um, I would dare say it's even her personal mission, is about using data and improving and, and doing research using data to improve population health and specifically with adolescents and children and her research institute has made significant gains in doing that in linking social determinants of health care uh, to, to health care outcomes. One of the projects that um, was started, I think, before Fiona got involved was something called the WA Data Linkage Project. WA is Western Australia, and it's actually where I'm from, on the west coast of, w of Australia, as you might have guessed. Uh, anyway, this project's been going on for 30 years, never had a data breach, and what does it do? It links data sets from all of those government departments. So you can see they're not just healthcare, you've got corrective services in there, police, housing, and they link all of those data sets together and they use that data to impact on health promotion, medical, and, uh, medical care and social policy. And they've had a lot of gains with that. We all know that healthcare is pretty much the quintessential wicked problem, okay? It's hard. <laughs> you know, if you're new to healthcare, welcome. Um, you're never going to leave because there is so much work to be done that uh, you'll be here for the rest of your natural born life because you'll be so committed to helping us change it. So it is a very much a wicked problem and we need collaborative approaches to work together and we can apply this same collaboration into the way that we manage data. And Fiona said, if we have good data on wicked problems and we can link it and protect privacy, all of which is pretty easily doable, then we don't use, and we don't use it to improve health and well-being and make services cost effective, we're being negligent. So I'm just going to flash this one up, so I thought there might be some questions on it. Um, Australia, for those of you who don't know, have a personally controlled electronic health record. Um, it'll probably get renamed soon because that's a bit of a mouthful. And you're not allowed to call it the PECA because the government gets really upset if you do. <laughs> just telling you, if you come and visit, don't call it that. Uh, so look, it went live last year. And, uh, and what it effectively means is that every Australian has a unique healthcare identifier. And if, we, if it's an opt-in system at present, um, if you want it, you can opt into this system and it enables you to have uh, shared electronic health records with healthcare clinicians that you choose to have access to your data, hence the personally controlled aspect of it. And it's going through a massive, going about to go through a massive change. So anyway, if you're interested in, it's a big focus on primary care, so I can talk about that more in the questions. Now these slides are, for, there's a few slides here from the Department of Health. I wanted to um, point out what the, the, some of the things that they're doing. So in uh, the state that I live in now is Victoria and uh, they are doing amazing things in regards to data. They've effectively um, re reorganise their entire department around making sure that they've got a workforce capability around data and a work program around data. Now it's early stages for them but the next few slides which again I'll just skip through quickly but they'll be in your resources if you want and if you're interested in further detail feel free to email me and I can put you in touch with the right people. Um, but they see themselves very much uh, as you know they don't, they don't deliver healthcare as much but the system does that they're responsible for. They have huge fiscal pressure just like everyone else, um, the huge demand on them, uh, and they're overseeing major changes though. They see themselves, and I thought this was really important, as a knowledge-based organisation with over 200 data collections, it's just the Department of Health, and it's heavily dependent on evidence-based policy. So again, harking back to what the Feds were talking about, about evidence-based policy as well. So they're actually doing a whole range of things around data uh, in their system. Um, one of the things which I'll just flash it up so you can see, they've, one of the, the workforce challenges, which I'm sure you're all facing with as well, they've actually come up with a workforce maturity model to actually look at how they manage information management. Uh, and they, they are, have got plans in place and they are moving up that pyramid. And there's a few references there you'll be able to see. In time. There's also national related things that the Department of Health is pretty much driving, um, which is just fantastic to be in a state that they're so progressive around this. And so this has been made a federal, so even though Kim Carr is no longer the minister and that we have a different government now, it is still very much a federal priority in working out what are we going to do with all this health data, how are we going to manage it, for what purposes, for what end, and how are we going to let it influence our policies as well as our provision of care. So generally, where do we want to be? Well, 
we want to oops sorry we want to manage uh, all of this data effectively in real time don't we Amazon knows when I go to that website that, oh, I think you'd like this video, Louise, or, you know, you should buy this product. Wouldn't it be awesome if healthcare worked that way, if we had that level of engagement with our healthcare system? Um, all of those of you who are responsible for building that are now looking at me going, shut up, stop talking about that. That's way too hard. But as consumers, isn't that what we want? And we, so we need to create a learning healthcare system so that things are learned from every person at every interface every time. And if we think that's too hard, it sounds like the UK are doing that now. Uh, so, you know, that's well done. <laughs> I see that there are five significant challenges, though, in making sure those things happen. Paper. And this picture is actually, I stole this from Richard Granger with his full knowledge uh, back when he was heading the NPFIT program in the UK. But we are just mostly, most of our records are still kept on paper. How do we do big data when the information is in, on, on a paper format? Interoperability is another challenge. So we, in the, where we have systems that are actually uh, electronic, often they don't talk to each other. They're all in closed houses. You know, well, sorry, that's closed API. If you want, my, um, you, if, you know, as a hospital, if you want to use the pathology system, then you have to buy it from my company. Just antiquated ways of doing business, absolutely antiquated. And we will be moving past that. Just, it'll take a while because there's, uh, there's in, entrenched policies and a lot of money being spent on the systems we have now but it's an old way of doing business and it just won't last. It's not sustainable. This picture, which I think is really awesome, I don't know if you recognise it, but it's from the Olympics in China where they had, I don't know, hundreds, it seemed like thousands of drummers working in unison. This amazing display they put on uh, at the Olympics, really well-oiled machine. Well, how do we build a workforce in healthcare that can actually manage this data capability that we need? We need all the specialist data people. We need statisticians. I was surprised to learn from a statistician that world-leading big data programs don't often have one statistician on them. Not one. I was shocked to hear that. But so we need all the data people, but then we also need clinicians to know about data, to know its importance. Most of them will be the ones collecting it. Most of them are the ones collecting it. They're not trained in data management. If you try to do that, boring. Like if you get them to show up, how do we, how do we engage clinicians in data and its importance? It's not, that's a challenge. That, you know, again, we could probably work on internationally to look at how we're going to solve that. Another challenge, data reliability, because we don't train the people who actually enter the data and we don't actually create appropriate work systems for them to enter the data within their workflow, a lot of the data we have is really unreliable, very poor standards. And the poor clinicians too, so I'm not doctor bashing here, the poor clinicians, that we don't give them the tools, we don't give them the systems, you know, and when we do, often they're poorly designed, they're not fitted well into their workflow patterns, and then we wonder why they resist it, you know, we can do better than that. But there are also opportunities. As I said, we're not in this alone. There's international collaborations that we can do. The immaturity of the sector I actually see as a huge opportunity. We, aren't gonna, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can collaborate, work together, and we don't have to pick up legacy systems and just run with that. Okay, so that, I see that as an opportunity. And one of the biggest opportunities is also this multidisciplinary approach. There are a lot of new people interested in this. So um, I'm doing a plug for Hacking Health, which starts today, um, because just try and, if you can, pop your head in and see what they're doing there. In these hacking events, you've effectively got a whole bunch of new people. I'm looking forward to seeing who's there. Usually they're younger, but even if they're not, the main important thing is it's a big mix of people. So you'll have the, the complete IT programmer geek there, clinicians, and you're also going to have designers and people who are engineers and a whole range of people. And it's that group of people where, that a lot of our innovations that we desperately need um, uh, and we can leverage off that. So that the way the hack's going to work is that clinicians are going to stand up there and say, oh, this is the problem that I have. I've got one minute, so this is a problem. And then they're going to form teams to work on how can we solve that problem. And they're so committed. For the next two days, they're going to be working to 10.30 at night. I'm sure there will be pizza and beer probably if they're young um, or just if you just want to sustain it. But anyway, so I think that's where a lot of this stuff can, is going. Um, now, the road to where we need to be is going to probably be long. Um, it'll probably be more expensive than we'd like, especially what Treasury would like. But if we're going to make significant and substantial progress and get to where we need to be, we simply don't have a choice. And we all have known that all know that but by working collaboratively together in a multidisciplinary environment we can get there okay thanks for your time